Greetings, everyone. Let me begin by first saying thank you very much for attending our recent School of Education webinar on faculty examples of good practices in online teaching. This is just a brief follow up based upon some of the feedback we received in the survey and interest in hearing a little bit more about the community of inquiry framework on social presence, cognitive presence and teaching presence. So this first visual may be familiar from our ACITS uh, community, and they definitely have encouraged the use of this particular framework as we think about teaching in online spaces and as we think about evaluating our own teaching. Uh, the Community of Inquiry framework is based on John Dewey's practical inquiry model, which includes many tenets of social constructivist theory and it's derived from this idea that knowledge construction is a collaborative and continuous process. So when this framework was originally developed in the late 90s, it was used to assess teaching and learning processes in asynchronous environments where the teaching and learning was mostly text-based. Since then, um, they've developed this model further and in addition to developing the model further, they've conducted follow-up research, and now this tool has become a useful tool in examining teaching and learning in higher ed environments that include blended learning environments where some of the teaching occurs online and then some of the teaching occurs face-to-face. -face. Also in web-based synchronous environments where the teaching occurs via video conferencing. And then as I mentioned before, even in face-to-face -face environments and virtual environments, you can apply this framework in those different settings. So as our teaching and learning has evolved, so has this model where you begin to see a framework that is a little bit more detailed. So under social presence, we see engagement with participants. We see the ways in which that can overlap in how we support the discourse in our classes and how we engage our students with the content those items, of course, falling under cognitive presence. We also begin to see how regulating learning and setting the climate also are connected to engaging with the goals and the direction, all falling under the idea of teaching presence. So just to be a little bit more specific about how social presence is defined, uh, it is the ability for the participants to engage in their community and project their own personal characteristics into that learning environment. So this is where the participants are their real selves, where it's not just moving in a virtual space, but it's acknowledging the physical presence of the individual within that space. Cognitive presence is the extent to which the participants in this community of inquiry are able to construct meaning. And they construct that meaning through sustained, purposeful communication. So we often um, use the term higher order thinking. This is where the construct of cognitive presence is most concerned with uh, the higher order thinking is within this area where we engage students with the content. The teaching presence is it's the design and the facilitation of the learning experience. It is how the cognitive and social processes are guided for the purpose of achieving the learning goals and the learning outcomes that have been set forth as we develop our online instruction. The whole framework itself is consistent with the values and goals of education and our goal, our main goal to promote deep learning and of course meaningful, meaningful inquiry. So the underpinning assumption is that the most optimal educational experience occurs when all of these areas interact with one another. So we're adding layers here. So now what we're demonstrating is how the School of Education's elements of good practice and online teaching map onto the Community of Inquiry framework. Um, this is not to replace what has already been shared in the primer video uh, by Dean Wall related to Addie's five-phase model. Um, it's still important to consider that framework, especially when it comes to developing your learning goals and going through the learning process in the online space even all the way through to evaluating your own um, instruction to further inform the next step or the next direction you'll go or even how you'll reimagine how you deliver your online instruction. So Addie's model is still relevant and there were several other models that were discussed. We're demonstrating here a follow-up to the webinar in which 
this model of the community of inquiry framework was presented and we're showing how the School of Education's good practices can map onto this framework. So beginning on the left hand side at the bottom where we definitely have emphasized the need to set your learning objectives and learning goals for your course, you'll see that that fits very well into the area of setting the climate in your class. Dr. Mogsy gave the example of co-constructing learning objectives with your students. That is one way to do it. How you display the these uh, learning goals in your courses and your Moodle course can vary. They can be text-based or video-based. So we want to just show here how not only does it map onto the community of inquiry framework, but there are also some different ways in which we can go about facilitating outlining the goals within our Moodle structure. Uh, the next area of interactive opportunities for students to engage with one another. This happens under the social presence category. Uh, you can also see examples of how you might do that, utilizing Flipgrid or discussion boards or even Yammer. Again, three things that were discussed on the webinar. Over to the right hand side at the top, interactive opportunities for students to engage with content. We saw some great examples using Yammer, Padlet, or even Edpuzzle. Again, these are under the cognitive presence category. Uh, keeping in mind though that uh, we're not suggesting that you use every single tool that that is on here, we do encourage finding one, finding the one you're comfortable with, exploring that tool with your students, and allowing the pedagogy to drive the instruction, not the tool itself. Uh, for example, if you find that you have an assignment that requires students to read a piece of literature and to critically examine what they've read through, through the written word, we are not suggesting that you have to always use Yammer or Padlet. It might be that for that particular assignment, it's most effective to have the students read a PDF and to highlight the PDF to save that document and then to use Word to type their written word, their written response to then save and upload to Moodle. Uh, that would still be an effective use of technology in the online learning space. Moving on next to assessment, we have different ways in which you can assess and these are remembering that um, that these are ways you can assess for prior knowledge as well as assessing at the end of the semester. So you can use quizzes, surveys, uh, there are even opportunities within Moodle to do student presentations using Kaltura and then there are other examples such as Kahoot. Uh, the, the reason why we definitely want to highlight what's useful within Moodle is that we know that we are becoming very comfortable with using that platform right now. And so sometimes having the ability to keep the learning within that space might be comfortable for the first week or two of class. So we encourage you to do what's most comfortable for you and for your students, um, keeping in mind that much of what we are recommending, there are Moodle alternatives to doing these different things. So so when we mention quizzes and surveys for assessment, quizzes can be done directly within Moodle. Moving on to the next area, which falls under the teaching presence, is coming up with these multiple forms of content, and that can range from narrated slides using PowerPoint, uh, podcasts, or video, and there are some other great examples that were named in the primer video and also in the webinar if you have a chance to go back and watch either. Please take the time to do that if you can. And finally, just that one last reminder, we do have some upcoming dates, some upcoming workshops that we'd love for you to participate in. We have May 7th, May 14th, May 21st, and May 28th, where we do plan to do deeper dives into the different areas that were just discussed. And we will take our time to go through each of those. So we won't discuss all of them on one day. We'll discuss each of them, each of those four areas one at a time. You'll talk about learning goals, we'll talk about assessments, we'll talk about interactive uh, ways to engage students with each other, and we'll talk about interactive ways for students to engage with the content. So we look forward to seeing you at one of our future dates, and please remember to also watch out for your Monday morning message, your stay at home messages, your School of Education Dean messages, the ACITS resources, and, is, and also if you have a moment to attend a Hunsaker teaching program session on a Tuesday, please take a moment to do that as well. Thank you again, and we will see you online.